Hey everyone, welcome to the third lesson, Federico here. In this lesson, we are going to see how we can represent the GGL texture object in Max as an actual object. So as we did in the first video for the JIT matrix, we will see in this video how we can create an object that represents a texture in the patcher. And this is very important because it will lay the foundations for our more complex patching that we will, that we will do with GL objects in the future. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. So. Let's start by getting rid of the second uh, snippet, the second bunch of objects that we created in the last video. We just need one JIT movie object to play our video. And if you remember, in order to play the video automatically, we need to set the JIT world on. So once we set the JIT world on, this video starts automatically to play because the JIT movie with output texture one is connected implicitly with the JIT world, which means every time the JIT world re-triggers the whole GL context, this JIT movie will receive a bang message or some instruction to output its current frame. But thanks to the unique attribute, we are outputting uh, only frames that are different from each other. That's why we get a 30 frames per second here, while the JIT world is running at 60 frames per second. Okay, cool. So in the first video, we saw how we can represent a jitter matrix, which is kind of this abstract concept. It's more like a data structure concept. Uh, we saw how we can represent it as an actual object inside Max, and this we can do through the JIT matrix object. And we saw that we can give some arguments to the JIT matrix object in order to shape this data structure. So we could have like four planes, which we saw are necessary for displaying a video because they contain the alpha, red, green, and blue channels. And then we say that we can give it a data type like char, which is one byte, which is number between zero and 255. And then we saw that we can give it some dimensions. We represent how many pixels or cells we have in this matrix. For example, if we take a look at this um, matrix with the JIT cell block object. So if we give a look at the content of this matrix, uh, let's do it. Let's connect it to the JIT cell block. This matrix is now empty. If we output this matrix to the JIT cell block object with a bang, we will see that we get 10 by 10 cells. Let's actually make it smaller so it's easy to understand. Okay, so we get two by two cells. And in each one of these cells, we left four numbers. In fact, if we send the plain minus one message to JIT cell block, which will make the JIT cell block visualize all the planes at once, all the values inside each cell at once, we will see that we get four zeros. We can also fill uh, this matrix with uh, a single value at our choice with the set all and then a value of our choice, which in this case must be uh, included between zero and 255 because this is a char matrix. So let's say set all 128. And as you can see the JIT cell block, we show that each a cell of the matrix as each plane, so each data inside each cell set to 128. Cool, so the set all is kind of a little bonus here for this video. Cool, so once we understand this, let's see how uh, we can do the same, almost the same thing for texture. So what is the object that we need to, that we want to create when we want to represent the texture in uh, Max? And this object is called JITGL texture. Note that it has this GL particle in its name because all the OpenGL objects or objects that work objects that work with the GPU have this GL in their name, right? So they're all part of the JIT GL library. And the JIT world as well is part of that. It's kind of the boss of all this library, but it doesn't have the GL uh, particle in its, in its name. So the GGL texture is an OpenGL object and represents a texture inside Max. So we said in the previous video that the texture is an image that resides on the video RAM and it's directly on the GPU. So that's why it's so fast to play videos through textures and also is processed by the GPU and not by the CPU. So this makes the processing of a texture much faster than the processing of matrices because matrices are processed on the CPU, which has a lot of other stuff to do than processing matrices for us. And also it's a lot less coarse than the GPU, but this is all, uh, this is all we explained in the previous video. So if we want to set um, now the same attributes for the, the JIT matrix has, like the plane count, Remember, all these values that we set here are actually represent attributes of the JIT matrix. So the JIT matrix has a playing count. If we right click on the inlet, we can see that it has a playing count. We can see that it has a type, which by default is char. 
we can see that it has some dimensions which we set to two by two, right? And we can set all these attributes for the JIT matrix using arguments. We could also set them using uh, attributes, right? We could say, okay, I want the plane count for this matrix to be four, and this will be exactly the same thing as writing this four here. Or we can say that we want the type to be char, and this will be exactly the same thing. Remember that an attribute always trumps uh, an argument. So if we will set here the type to float32, even though we set the type in the arguments as char, when we set it as an attribute, the attribute will trump the, the argument. So if we set here float32 and here we set char, we will have that the type is float32 because the attribute always has the precedence. And of course, this also works for the dimensions. If we set like 4x4, four four, these will then have 4x4 four cells, these jitter matrix. Okay, cool. So let's see how it works with a GGL texture. And a GGL texture is very similar to a jitter matrix. The only differences are that we cannot set these um, these attributes as arguments. So we cannot say like for float 32 and then the dimensions. We cannot do that. We must set them as attributes. So if we want to change the dimension of uh, this texture, we have to set it uh, manually with the, uh, the attribute dim. By default, the texture dimensions are going to be, let's see, 512 by 512 by zero, because there is even a third dimension for textures and for matrices as well, but we're going to see that in the future. So if we want to change those dimensions, we have to set it manually using the dim attribute. If we want to change the data type, we have to set it manually using the uh, type attribute. By default, it will be char, we set it to float 32. The only thing we cannot change is the plane count. So we cannot say like plane count four. As you can see, there is no attribute called plane count in a GGL texture. If we right click here and we look for plane count, there is no attribute called plane count. And that's because a texture always has four planes. So let's write this now. GGL texture always has four planes. We can never have less than four planes. A matrix can have uh, like from one to 32 planes. Uh, we, for the moment, we only saw matrices with four planes, but a matrix can have from one to 32 planes, but a texture can only have four planes. So let's write this down as well. A JIT matrix can have from one to 32 planes, while a digital texture always has four planes. So if we want to change the dimensions of these, uh, oh, and why it's written JIT matrix here, this should be digital texture, but it doesn't really matter because we can see it from the message that this is outputting a GGL texture and also from the blue cable. So if we want to use this texture here to change the dimension of the input texture, which um, uh, we know this video is full HD, this video is 9020 by 1080. In fact, if we use the GTFPS GUI to check the dimensions, we can see that this is 9020 by 1080. So if we want to change those dimensions, we can use the GGL texture and set it, for example, to 10 by 10. Now, it's happening something interesting because the first video we did it this with the matrix and we just saw the pixels, right? Um, when we do this with a texture, we see these interpolated colors. You see that the values here are being interpolated. We are not just seeing the pixels. It's kind of interpolating between the pixels to have this mover, uh, this mover transitions between the pixels. And that's because we are sending a bigger texture to a smaller texture. And when a smaller texture tries to sample a bigger texture, it will interpolate between the pixels of the bigger textures and will send out this interpolated output. Now, if we don't want to have this, if we just want to see the pixels, there is an attribute that we have to change, which is the filter attribute. By default, it's set to linear. We can set it to known. And we have another type, which is nearest. So if we set to nearest, it's basically going to behave like known. But what nearest does, is going to take the closest pixel to the sampling position currently processed by the GGL texture object. All this stuff we were going to see in the future. You just need to know that if you don't want to see the, the interpolation, uh, you just have to set, set this attribute to known. And a jitter matrix can do the same thing. It can interpolate, but only from smaller matrices to bigger matrices. And this must be set through the interp attribute. We're going to see this in the future as well. Another thing that you should know is that we can change from um, texture to matrices. We can convert from texture to matrices. In fact, if we create a JIT matrix here, and we send this texture to this JIT matrix, 
this matrix is going to receive the texture as input, is going to convert it into a matrix and is going to output it. Now, this sending the texture to the matrix, as we say in the last video, it means sending data from the video RAM to the RAM. And this is something that is pretty slow. It's not something that we want to do just like that. Now, if we really need to transform a jitter texture into a jitter matrix, there are some cases in which we will want to do that. We should use this object, which is called GGL async read. And as you can see, this is also a GL object, which means it works uh, implicitly with the connection to this JIT world. And what it does is that it converts textures to matrices. If we recall its help file, we can see that the, this object uses a pixel buffer object to perform asynchronous reads of the OpenGL context at high frame rates. This means that this, um, this reading from the GPU to the CPU is done asynchronously. It means it's not going to block all the patches operation before the last frame has been transported to the CPU from the GPU is going to do that kind of on a side pipeline. So if you want to transform a texture into a matrix, you should do it using this uh, GGL async read object. Cool. Now, a very important thing, which I almost forgot to include in this video, is that the color channels in a texture are organized in a different way as in a jitter matrix. So we said in the first video that the color channels in a jitter matrix that comes out from a JIT movie are organized in this way. So we have alpha, red, green, and blue. So if we would unpack those channels, we would have that the first channel that comes here from the left is the alpha, then we would have the read, red, green, and blue. If we want to assign an index to those channels, which will be useful later in our learning journey. We will have that the alpha is at index 0, red is at index 1, green is at index 2, and blue at 3. Now, in a texture, the channels are organized in a different way. So all the OpenGL objects actually use this other arrangement. And this is that the alpha is actually at the end. So we the first channel at index 0 will be the red, then we got green, blue, and alpha is actually on the fourth channel, so at index 3. So for the moment, this doesn't impact in any way our working with the JIT movie and texture, but it will be very important later to know that. So if you ever work with textures and you found yourself not understanding why the colors were not represented in the correct way, that could be the reason. But don't worry, we're going to see this over and over during our tutorials. And that was almost the last thing I wanted to show you. The, uh, before, I, before we close, I wanted to show you how we can have the JIT rendering window. So this window that is actually somewhere behind my patch, always visible. And this we can have with the floating attribute of the JIT world. So if we set floating here to one, you can see that the window will always stay on top of the patcher, okay? It's never going to disappear on the back. While if we set it to zero, uh, if I click anywhere in the patcher, uh, the window is going to disappear. So if I want to have the window always on top, which I mostly do, uh, we can set this attribute for the JIT world called floating and set it to one. And then we need to activate again the JIT world. Okay, so this was it for this video. As I say, not a long one. Hope you found this interesting. And in the next video, we're going to see some more cool stuff. Check out my Patreon to get this patch. And if you support the channel, you can download hundreds of other patches. And I will see you in the next lesson. Take care. Ciao.